This is week four in your nursing research course, and this week we're talking about quantitative research. We're going to begin by discussing your research design, and your textbook provides you a very good graphic that talks of, that, that basically shows you the interrelationship between your design, your hypothesis, your theoretical framework, your literature review, and your problem statement. When you're reading research articles that are quantitative in nature, you should be able to find all of these within the article if it is a well-designed and well-written article. It's important for you to understand uh, the usefulness of the study, especially if you are then going to include it as part of your evidence-based practice. Researchers have the option to choose from many different types of designs for their research. And one way to think of your design is as a pattern or a blueprint. In the current days, many people have been making their own face mask. But most people don't start making that face mask without a pattern or without instructions that came from somewhere. And you may look at the patterns that other people have made or the instructions other people have given you, and you may decide that you want to alter that a little so that you have your own pattern. The same can be said with research. One of the things you always want to do is you want to make sure that you have good control so that you've defined your measures that you're using in your research. And you want to make sure that you're eliminating all possible bias or, or errors in your measurement of your dependent variable, which of course, is your outcome variable. Some considerations in the design of a study are objectivity and conceptualizing the research question. Now this may seem obvious, but for many of us, especially those of us who are practicing clinicians, we often don't realize we have a strong bias in what we expect an outcome to be if we do research. And we need to make sure that when we design our research, we're not building in our own bias so that we, it leads us to the answer we think we want to have. Feasibility, I'm going to come back to in a minute because there's a whole slide on that. Um, Control and intervention, fidelity is important. Uh, you need to be able to maintain intervention fidelity or the constancy of your intervention. And this means that you need to train carefully the people that are collecting your data so that everyone is collecting data in the same way. I remember the first research I participated in was as an undergraduate. And the professor was doing research on people that he had in an observation room. And our job was to sit on the other side of a two-way mirror and put little check marks next to uh, specific behaviors that the person may exhibit. And the professor made us do three of those and make sure that they were consistently graded and correctly, and correctly checked off before any of the ones that we did would count. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about internal and external validity. This is the slide where I said I would talk to you a little bit more about feasibility. And I believe that feasibility in research is critical. Many of us have grand ideas of all the work that we would like to do. I have a long list. And 
My long list is not feasible, and even some of the things I would like to do would be great projects if I had the funding to do them. And even if I had the funding, where would I have the time? You need to consider these things in advance. Time is always a big question. And for you, many of you are practicing clinicians. If you're doing research in your facilities, you're probably doing this as an extra duty. If you're getting time to do it, most likely you're not getting as much time as it will take you and you're just doing it because it's something you love doing. So one of the questions must always be, is the time period for the study realistic? And it's not just your time period, but how long will the study take to do? How many measurements? Um, uh, will this occur over months or years? And then the subject availability, which is to say you must have participants in your study and how hard will it be to get them? There are a lot of people that would like to do studies on rare diseases. The problem is you usually can't get enough participants to do that type of study. For some of the things you're doing in our class, you are looking at nurses and specifically nurses and addressing COVID-19. Right now, there are plenty of participants that could participate in the study. The question is, do they have time to participate? Uh, facilities and equipment are always important. And you need to make sure that if your research requires equipment, uh, such as questionnaires and computers, that first of all, you have access to those. A lot of the questionnaires that you will use, you need to pay for. And, and that is a cost that you then must consider. Money. Money is a big issue in research. You need to figure out a way to get your work paid for. And you should do this well before you start the study. In fact, you usually want one of the first things you will do is create a budget and figure out how much it is going to cost you. Expenses for doing a study can be minimal, $1,000. Uh, but huge studies that are um, randomized control trials can be hundreds of thousands of dollars and run several years. And then finally, you must always consider the ethics. So research that places unethical demands on subjects is not a feasible study. You have all now completed your ethics training and you've done a city course and I think you should have a good idea of the ethical considerations in doing research. Let's turn to validity and have a brief discussion about validity. Validity basically tells us how much we can trust the study re results and does it reflect the truth external validity concerns the generalizability of the findings of one study to additional populations and other environmental conditions in other words can I take what I did in my study and apply it to a bigger population of people? How much does your study then reflect what happens in the real world? If I observe nurses donning and doffing PPE and those procedures in a facility, then I'm observing that in the real world, which is the hospital or the clinic where they're donning and doffing PPE in their natural environment where they would do that. And my study as a result should have good external validity. It's always good to remember that 
to some extent, when I'm looking at the external validity and the internal validity, it's going to be a little bit of a, a give and take because once we have a study with high external validity, it may um, be time to then do more specific clinical trials or randomized control trials than to make sure that I also have internal validity. To get both, it may take more than one study. Internal validity asks whether the independent variable really made the difference or the change in the dependent variable. We can ask ourselves if we know what caused the variance in the dependent variable. I may not know from my PPE study what caused the nurses to don and doff PPE appropriately because I was watching them in the natural environment to see if they did it and if they did it appropriately. But I might not know what other factors or what other variables were influencing the proper donning and doffing of PPE. So I would have poor internal validity. If I did a study that controlled for other variables and I did it in a lab environment where I can control everything and then I asked nurses to don and doff PPE, I would have much better internal validity. Good internal validity requires us to do experiment, experiments. We need to control for all of those external factors that we cannot control for in the natural environment. And thus again, we must find a reasonable mix where we have internal and external validity. You always want to make sure that you know the threats to validity. And, and one of the threats that we think of is history. Your book gives an example of a study that tested an exercise program intervention in cardiac care rehabilitation center at one center and compared the outcomes to those in another center in which the usual care was given. And they said that during the final months of data collection, the control hospital implemented an e-health physical activity intervention. Well, obviously, um, this is important to know, and it would have an impact on your internal validity. Maturation uh, evaluates um, the effects that, that you have as you proceed through a study um, or the effects that happen as a person may develop and no more. So if you were studying children, for example, over a period of time, they are certainly going to change if you looked at them over a two or three year period. And you can look through many of these threats to inter internal validity, like testing and instrumentation, mortality, certainly, and then selection bias. Uh, I think selection bias is something really important to consider because we want to try to make sure that we put in inclusion and exclusion in, in criteria so that we can avoid selection bias. And then for external validity, of course, then there is always the issue of selection effects. So who did we select for the process? Selection bias can result from how the subjects were chosen. Clearly, if you're using a convenient sample, in other words, people in your church or people that work in your clinic or nurses you know, then, then you are going 
to have selection bias. And then the other two types of bias that you would likely experience in external validity would be reactive effects. And reactive effects are most closely linked to testing and to history in internal validity. And then the measurement effects. And the measurement effects tend to also be related to internal validity of things such as maturation, the instrumentation used, and the testing. Finally, one of the things that you will be doing this week is critically appraising the criteria for quantitative research. You're going to be asked, is the type and design that was used appropriately? Are the various concepts of control consistent with the type of study design chosen? Does the design used seem to reflect the considerations of feasibility issues? Does the design used seem to flow from the proposed research question, theoretical framework, literature review, and hypothesis. What are the threats to internal validity or sources of bias? What are the controls for the threats to internal validity? What are the threats to our external validity and generalizability? What are the control for the threats to external validity? And is the design appropriately linked to the evidence hierarchy? I believe that if you follow this as a basic outline for your critical appraisal criteria for your quantitative research article, that it should be easy to check your way through it and determine whether your article is well done or not so well done. Now, don't be deceived. A lot of Poor quality articles do get published in referee journals. So you cannot assume that because it is published in a journal, it was correctly done. Ideally, the article should address all of these things. But not all articles do. And if you can't find it, it may be because it isn't there. If you have any questions, again, my office hours are always on Monday. Please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.